Today I'm talking to Mark Clampin, Director of Science and Exploration at NASA's Goddard Space Center. Both Mark and Goddard have been heavily involved in one of NASA's biggest upcoming missions that has been decades in the making, the James Webb Space Telescope. Webb is the largest space telescope ever developed and will revolutionize our view of the cosmos. Mark tells us what makes Webb so special. So James Webb is going to be the largest space telescope that we've ever flown to conduct uh, astrophysical studies. That's, that's quite simply the bottom line. Uh, it's got a six and a half meter um, aperture telescope, and it's also designed to be an infrared telescope. So infrared is heat radiation. So that presents uh, a lot of uh, very interesting challenges as you build um, a telescope like this. And we've built um, James Webb to be a uh, observatory level facility rather than um, a sort of one-off mission. So it really follows in the shoes of the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. And it's designed to allow us to do astrophysics for the next five to 10 years. And you say it'll be looking at the, the infrared. What particular sort of parts of the infrared will it be looking at? So as I said, James Webb is an observatory, so it can be looking at a number of different um, science themes, if you like. The original science theme that really drove the um, people to conceive of the James Webb is looking for the very first stars and galaxies in the universe. So with the um, Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to look back to the order of about a a billion years after the Big Bang, there's a few examples that may be a little uh, closer to the Big Bang than that. But in general, about um, a billion years. And these have been found using these very deep field observations. We think the very first stars and galaxies formed somewhere in the region of 100 million to 300 million years after the Big Bang. And the challenge for us is that the light from those galaxies, because it's red shifted so far into the red, is actually occurring in the infrared and Hubble cannot see that far into the infrared. So in order to study you know, the very early um, formation of galaxies and stars, we really need to push into the infrared where we can actually see these objects. And then we need a very large aperture because they're extremely faint and we need to collect lots of light. So that's, that's the primary motivation. Uh, there are other mo motivations for building uh, web. We were also interested in how galaxies have evolved over the history of the universe. And Hubble has sort of helped us quite a lot with that problem, but we still need to do a lot of work in the infrared and in that sort of gap between the very first galaxies and where we can see back to with Hubble right now. Closer to home, and I, I mean in our own galaxy, uh, we also want to study how stars uh, form and evolve, you know, those, you know, what is the life cycle of a star. And Hubble has taken all these beautiful pictures of these big dark dust clouds. What we want to do with Webb is actually peer inside these stellar nurseries and actually study stars as they're being formed and follow how, they, how they're born and then how they evolve. And also how the planetary systems that we think and we know are sort of forming around these stars also are created. So that, that's another theme. And then the final theme that we're really sort of jazzed about, because this is such a new and exciting field is, or at least I am, I should say, because it's my research area, is studying other worlds. So in the last um, decade, you know, we've gone, gone from knowing that there's, you know, a couple of hundred exoplanets to now we know there's about 4,000 confirmed planets around other stars, which we call exoplanets. And with Hubble, we've started studying the atmosphere, so some of the really big gassy um, planets. And with James Webb, we'll be able to do a much better job and start to look at uh, objects that are called uh, super Earths or even potentially, you know, some Earth-like planets as well, and actually look at the atmospheres of these planets and their composition. So a lot of really exciting science that we'll be able to do for the first time with this telescope. It does actually sound like there's going to be loads of stuff going on. Um, but first, yeah. of course, you have to, to, to get this telescope into space. Were there any really big technological difficulties with trying to get a 6.5 meter mirror into space? There are two major challenges. So as I said, this is an infrared telescope. And in the past, when we've flown infrared telescopes, we've kind of had a big um, doer attached to them 
with full of liquid helium to keep them cold. But over the lifetime of a couple of years, all that helium boils off, and then you don't have an infrared telescope anymore. Uh, the problem with heat radiation is you, you need your telescope to be cold enough that it's not actually seeing its own thermal signature. And for the science that we want to do with uh, James Webb, we actually have to have the telescope as cool as 40 Kelvin, which is 40 degrees above absolute zero or minus 390 Fahrenheit. So that's quite a challenge. And if you want it to stay that cold over the whole lifetime of the mission, you have to get innovative and come up with a new way of doing this. And the approach that we've taken is something called passive cooling. And the idea is that you uh, basically fly the telescope with a large uh, tennis court size array of membranes. And then they allow you to keep the telescope side of the um, observatory extremely cold. It just cools down to the temperature that we want to operate at. And then on the other side of those membranes, we've got the spacecraft bus and all the stuff that we need to be looking at the sun, like the solar array. So it's a very different concept. And that then brings us to the other big challenge of this telescope, which is the you know, telescope, we don't have a rocket that can launch telescope size uh, capped on uh, membranes. And even as you know, deployed uh, six and a half meter aperture mirror, so we have to fold everything up for launch. And then once it's in space, we have to unfold everything or deploy it as we, as we use in, ter in terms of the jargon. So we have to actually you know, roll up these um, sun shields, as we call them, um, on pallets, fold them up around the telescope. The telescope itself folds up. And then once we launch it, we start unfolding everything over the space of about 30 days after launch. So that, that's very different from any telescope we've ever flown before. It's also the, the telescope looks quite un, unusual. Um, so it's got this, this huge mirror made up of 18 hexagons of, of plated with gold as well. And I was just wondering, what, why, why does it look so unusual? Why is it that different to most you know, silver telescopes that we see back on Earth? So it, it comes back to this issue of the deployment, right? So if you want to unfold your mirror after you've launched it, you can't have a single six and a half meter piece of glass. So we've made the mirror out of 18 individual segments and the central part of the mirror is, is 12, seg 12 segments. And then we have three on each side, which actually fold around the side of the telescope and we unfold them afterwards. And then since each mirror is independently adjustable, we just adjust each of those 18 mirror segments until we have the equivalent of a six and a half meter mirror surface. In answer to your question about gold, this is a uh, infrared telescope. And you know, having built a six and a half meter mirror, we don't want to throw a third of the photons that we could detect with the telescope away by using aluminum. So we use gold, which is uh, extremely reflect reflective in the infrared. And you know, we collect something like 97, 98% of all the light that hits the telescope. So that's, that's why it's coated with gold. The telescope's often been sort of touted as kind of like the successor to Hubble. Um, yep. How does it actually measure up with, with the Hubble Space Telescope? So it, it's hard to do an apples to apples comparison because Hubble was a visible telescope, uh, the image from the visible light down into the ultraviolet whereas James Webb can image just at the edge of the visible all the way out to the mid-infrared or 30 microns. So they really work in two different um, sort of parameter spaces, if you like. But if you just look at very simple comparisons, Webb has a much bigger mirror than Hubble, and Hubble's in what we call low Earth orbit. So Hubble orbits the Earth, it goes around the Earth every 90 minutes, and it can do science when it's on the dark side of the Earth. So for every orbit that Hubble does, we get science for 45 minutes of, of that orbit. And the rest of the time, we are on the bright side of the Earth and you can't do science. Webb instead is going to something called the second Lagrange point, which is a sort of quasi-gravitationally stable uh, place. If you think of the sun and you draw a line from the sun through the earth and then keep going for about a million miles, that's where L2 is. And Webb will orbit L2. 
So it's always in the sun, of course, because we need power for the solar arrays. But that's a long way from Earth, so it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in addition, it's also a very thermally benign environment out there. So as Hubble goes around the Earth, it's changing focus very slightly as it goes from day to night and night to day by about, I think, something you order of five microns. Now, you can't see that in Hubble's data, but if you tried to do that with Webb, with its much bigger mirror, you would see the image quality changing as it zoomed around the Earth. So by going to the second Lagrange point, we get lots more science and we get a very thermally stable telescope with solid image quality. And earlier we talked about uh, what exactly James W. Webb is going to be doing, the kind of science it's going to be doing. Is there anything that you particularly are looking forward to, any particular observations that you're really looking forward to? Yes, so there are two things that I, I find really exciting. One is um, this uh, new, relatively new field of doing the spectroscopy of um, exoplanet atmospheres. So over the last um, you know, 10 to 15 years, this has become a really important technique. And basically uh, planets that transit across the face of their host star cause a small dip in the light coming from that star. And if you disperse the light using a prism, um, for instance, during that, that period when the you know, planet transits across the star, you can actually then separate out the um, atmosphere of the planet from the spectral signature of the star. Now, I always tell people and several of my colleagues do, in order to do this, you have to do exactly what your math teacher told you not to do, which is to collect two very large numbers and then subtract them to get the um, part that's the signature of the exoplanet's atmosphere. But we've been doing this very successfully with Hubble. And you know this is going to be a really powerful technique for James Webb. We can start to look at uh, the atmospheres of super Earths, for instance, and we'll also be looking, you know, trying to look at smaller rocky planets as well, especially ones found by missions like NASA's TESS or Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which has found a lot of very bright, relatively nearby stars that have small rocky planets. So these are ideal targets for the James Webb. So that, that's one area that I'm extremely interested in. And the other area is just studying debris disks, which are the sort of leftover remnants of um, planetary system formation. And in the past, we've kind of used those debris disks as sort of signposts for places to look for planets. But in themselves, you know, they're very interesting um, objects and they give us a lot of information about how planetary systems form and evolve. And I know that James, Dub the, the JWST must be hugely oversubscribed you must have hundreds and hundreds of people applying for time on it um but are there any sort of long-term legacy plans to to do things going over several years with the JWST I I think um right now there are so the very the first year has been divided up into observations that will be conducted by the teams who built the instruments then there's um a set of observations that have been planned for the science community to get an early look at James Webb data and understand uh, the kind of performance that you get and then think about with this, with this sort of data, what can I do scientifically? And then there's a, um, a whole set of uh, proposals that were awarded based on their merit time on the James Webb. I think if you look, I mean, I'm speculating here, but you know, if you look at how the time was awarded, during the, the first competition for the, what we call the first cycle of observations, uh, there was a lot of interest in the, um, the early galaxies, you know, studying the very first galaxies in the universe. So I think that will be a, a, you know, ultimately a legacy of this telescope. And I think um, exoplanet atmospheres are going to be as well. You know, Webb is just such a powerful tool for doing this kind of science. Well, it certainly sounds like uh, JGWST's mission is just beginning and hopefully we'll see lots of new science coming from it in the years to come. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to talk to us, Mark. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>